Thank you, thank you so much, Matthias. That's very kind of you, especially since you haven't read it yet. That's, that's really wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm always honored and overjoyed to sing the gospel of Jesus with you guys week in and week out. It's one of the greatest delights of my whole life. And usually, usually guys, heresy is very costly, but today it's only 20 bucks, so that's you're in luck. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, hey, way more importantly than all of that, Thank all of you for being here today to worship Jesus with us, whether you've been here for two weeks or two years or two decades, we are grateful that you have decided to join us today. Um, if you are new around here, please stop by our guest services in the Commons. We have a team there that would love to help you out in any way that they can. And members and regulars, we have tons of fall studies and groups and opportunities that are kicking off right now, so you can go by Next Steps in the Commons, also near Auditorium One. And we have a team there that can uh, help you get all the details for those things. <clears throat> now, uh, many of you know this, but we usually preach and teach straight through entire books of the Bible on Sunday morning. We're getting ready to start James in a couple weeks, which I'm excited about. Um, but this, uh, today, this Sunday is our last Sunday in our summer series. For the last 12 weeks, we've been in a series called Here Is Your God, and we have been asking the question, what is God really like? because there are a lot of not good, kind of trashy opinions about what God is like out there. And so each week we've been answering this question, what is God really like, with a different attribute of God. A.W. Tozer says, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Meaning, how we think about God will season all of life. Like how we consider him and behold him will change how we approach and engage with everything in our life. And today, our capstone attribute of God isn't technically an attribute, but it's a way to talk about God's purest point of being. Today, we get to talk about God as triune, that he's trinity, that he is Three in one, and somehow he's one in three. Like, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, and somehow there's one God. And for fun, uh, God math, it's not that one plus one plus one equals one, it's that one times one times one equals one. It's fun, that's free, you don't have to pay for that one. The tri- look, the Trinity, look, I'm trying to show you that this is, it's a little mind-boggling and a little beautiful. God is three persons and one essence. It's, he's three who's and one what. And right now, there are a couple among you who are theological nerds, and I love you dearly, but you're like giddy. You're like, ooh, like I, I love this stuff, this abstract <clears throat> theoretical thinking about God. And look, I'm with you. I'm on your team a billion percent. I love the nerdy, fun, abstract theological thinking. <clears throat> but there are others among us And I'm just gonna go ahead and roll the dice and say that you have just politely flipped the I don't care at all switch in your brain uh, because that's just just too detached, bro. I live with my feet on the ground like I can't do that right now. Um, This summer, maybe you've been like, oh, God's love, dude, God's power, God's grace. I'm here for that because those things, I'm gonna pay attention there because those things have more, you know, pertinence to my life. But Trinitarianism, Jim, really, like before lunch, bro, I'm not doing this. How in the Moses does that have any meaningful impact on my life whatsoever. Like Jim, bro, I've got bills to pay. My financial life right now is a train wreck. My kids will not shut up. They're making terrible decisions. My romantic life is desolation. It's a dumpster fire, Jim. It's terrible. And you want me to think about the Trinity. That's what you want me to do. You want me to give mental space and mental strain to something that I know I can't understand fully. Thanks, but a big fat no thanks, Jim. Right, that might be some of you. And you know what, dude, I understand that, I get that. Or maybe you're here today, and <clears throat> if you're honest, you haven't talked a lot about it, but you're, you're struggling, like you're wrestling with a certain sin or, or idol or, or lust or addiction right now, and you showed up, and in your heart of hearts today, you're like, God, I just need a deep breath in my soul. I need help, I need freedom. I just need to taste God's forgiveness just a little bit, and I need a God Today, I need a God who understands what I'm going through. Or maybe you're here and you feel like, maybe you feel detached or separate, like the friends and the family that you have. There's, there's gaining distance right there somehow. Like you don't have a strong sense of community or a deep sense of belonging. <clears throat> or maybe you're depressed or 
anxious or angry, and maybe you're at a point in your life where you don't know how to do anything except operate out of fear, and all you want today is good news. All you want today is peace and hope in your chest. And I have just announced <clears throat> that we're gonna talk about the most seemingly impractical and unhelpful thing, the Trinity. People don't care about the Trinity. They probably don't even want to care about the Trinity. And if they do want to care, they certainly don't know how to. So I, I'm telling you right now, I get it. I know it's a stretch, but I promise you that thinking about God like this is gloriously worshipful and meaningful and practical, I promise. And if we think about this well today, I fully believe that it will change the way we experience all the troubles and curveballs that life throws at us. <clears throat> also, it's, it's really nice for me as, as the preacher to know that I'm not alone in this conviction and this thinking. About 1,500 years ago, St. Augustine of Hippo said the following about the Trinity. He wrote, there is no subject where error is more dangerous, research more laborious, and discovery more fruitful than the oneness of the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if you're tracking with me, this is a monster statement. This is huge. So yes, we're gonna do some thick thinking today, absolutely. But the fruitfulness that Augustine is talking about is a life fruitfulness. This is not just about dotting your theological I's and crossing your theological T's. Augustine is getting at human flourishing. He's getting at rightly navigating all your troubles and trials, all your sins and scars. He's saying, if we get the Trinity right, and we believe in it rightly, and we rejoice in it rightly, we will do life the right way. Again, <clears throat> there is no subject where error is more dangerous, research more laborious, and discovery more fruitful than the oneness of Trinity, of Father, Son, <clears throat> and Holy Spirit. So Augustine is saying that if we mess up here, um, it's gonna be detrimental and so much will crumble. It's gonna be fatal to our faith. But if we patiently think well about it, it will yield transformation and it'll bear abundant fruit. But the question is how, like how do we do that? What needs to change, what needs to be nuanced in our approach to God as three in one so that we can see this kind of fruit blossom in our lives. I mean, if you read church history, for Augustine and many, many other people throughout the history of the church, thinking about the Trinity has led to a strong faith and pure worship. But for a lot of us today, we rarely consider its significance, which therefore means we rarely bear its fruit. So, our question today is this, how can we think about the Trinity in such a way that it leads to worship and life change? That's what we need to think about today. How can we think about the Trinity in such a way that it leads to worship and life change? We don't want to just check this doctrine off of like, yes, we believe that, yes, we should believe it, that's important. We don't just want to see maybe a little bit behind the curtain of divine mechanics of how God works as triune, yes, that's important. We want to know and sense God as triune in the midst of our frenetic and fragile lives so that he will be adored rightly. That's what we want. And today, we'll find help to answer our question in John chapter 14. If you wanna go ahead and get there in your Bibles, that would be good, great, wonderful. John ch chapter 14, take your time and hurry up. Today, we'll be reading verses one through 20. John chapter 14, verses one through 20. And this passage will answer our question, how can we think about the Trinity in such a way that it leads to worship and life change? Also, in gratitude for the uh, incalculable treasure that is Holy Scripture, I'll read our passage and then I'll say my line, which is the word of God for the people of God, and then comes your line, <clears throat> out loud together, make it a good one. Thanks be to God, you two auditorium one. Here we go, John chapter 14, we will start in verse one. John chapter 14, verse one. <clears throat> Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go prepare a place for you, I'll come again and I'll take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, uh, Lord, we don't know the way where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, 
I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Verse eight. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Philip, have I been with you so long you still don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Verse 12. Truly, truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these he will do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. <clears throat> Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, <clears throat> you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Now, if you're paying any minute level of attention, you're like, oh, wow. You know that there's so, so much in this passage. So just a couple of things before we dive into John's words directly. First, this sermon is not about nailing down a systematic theology and doctrine of the Trinity perfectly. That's not what we're doing here today. That's a great thing to do. There are dozens of passages in the Bible that suggest the divinity of the Father and the divinity of the Son and divinity of the Spirit. <clears throat> That's great. There are even texts in the Bible where all three members of the Trinity are listed together. Jesus' baptism, Matthew chapter 3, the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, uh, the, the benediction at the end of 2 Corinthians. Paul has a song. It's a three stanza hymn in Ephesians chapter 1. It's a 12-verse single sentence in which all members of the Trinity are there. <clears throat> you can go read those and others on your own. Also, I'm very much uh, being a theological nerd and restraining myself from giving you a bunch of book commercials, which you know I love to do. If you would like a good resource on the Trinity, please shoot me an email, and I'm happy to send those your way. Um, but something else needs to be said here. The main point of this passage that we just read in John chapter 14, the main point of this passage is not to prove that God is three in one. That's not the point of the text. However, if we assume that we have studied well the doctrine of the Trinity, and the rest of Scripture, we will be able to see a certain kind of beauty in this text. We'll be able to see this text from a special, beautiful angle. Now, for a little bit of background on the passage, John 14, the scene that we just read through is Jesus in the upper room with his disciples. Now, on a timeline here, Jesus is about 90 minutes, all right, 90 minutes from going into the garden and getting arrested on his way to the cross, so this is in the immediate shadow of the cross. And the disciples, they totally don't know what's happening, but they can feel that something intense is about to go down. They feel it. There's a kind of heaviness in the room as Jesus speaks, even if he's saying good things. There's kind of a gravitas to what's going on. Going on. Something is about to go down, and they're a little fearful about it. This is the fear of the unknown 101, right? They're a little fearful, a little scared about their friend. <clears throat> they're shaking in their sandals, and that's why Jesus starts the way he does in verse one. Look at verse one, look. Let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts operate out of fear. Let not your mind convince you that you are defined by confusion. Let not your mind convince you that you're defined by your worst moment. Let not your identity be in your confusion or your pain or your situation. Jesus knows that his followers that night and still today have a proclivity to, we have a proclivity to, let what we feel the most intensely in any given moment be the most important thing about us. Rather, what we think about God should perhaps be the most important thing about us. And in this chapter, 
as Jesus deals and interacts with his troubled friends, guess what? It is rock solid Trinitarian truth that will give them peace. It's not seven easy steps to this or that. It is a rock solid foundation of God as triune that Jesus is extending to his friends to give them peace, even though they might not know totally how to put all that together. Notice what he says immediately in verse one. Let not your hearts be troubled. Look, believe in God, <clears throat> believe also in me. That means the root system underneath this statement is deeply Trinitarian. If you've done any Bible at all, you know that there's only one supreme object of our belief, just one, God himself. There's only one true focus of our faith, God himself. And here Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me. So Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. But you know what's underneath this? You know what this text is saying? That first verse is just saying this. Hey, what are you worried about? Hey man, how's life hard? How is it? I know it is. How are you troubled? Peter, didn't I just tell you you're about to go deny me? Are you scared of the crazy religious elite dudes who are gonna come take me? Are you scared of the crazy religious elite dudes who might come take you? Are you confused because you think that God owes you and you think that he's withholding even though scripture says he's not? Are you stressed out in your life right now because you are now realizing that relationships are just a lot harder than you thought they were supposed to be? If so, there is an anchor for your soul made of nothing but Trinitarian truth, nothing. Let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. <clears throat> and here's the fun part, Jesus is just getting started. Scroll down to verse six. Thomas asks a question <clears throat> and then Jesus claims to be the way, the truth, and the life. Then you go to verse nine, Philip asks a question, and then Jesus says, if you have seen me, think about this, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And then verse 10, he goes even further. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And please note, each of these statements is certifiably insane for any first century Jewish anybody to ever mutter at all. This, in, in the first century for a Jewish person, this is like apostasy 101, like how to commit sacrilege 101. That's exactly what's going on. You don't say these things. You don't joke about these things. But Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. He is pushing his friends to reconsider and rethink the question that we have been asking all summer. What is God really like? And perhaps, perhaps he's bigger and more magnificent and more mysterious than you have yet realized, perhaps. Scroll down to verse 16. <clears throat> Jesus says, the Father <clears throat> will give you another helper to be with you forever. And I love this language right here. The implication is, is that Jesus <clears throat> is a helper from the Father and the Spirit is also a helper from the Father. This word helper is incredible. In the original language in Greek, it can mean comforter or counselor or advocate. It, it can be the come alongsider. <clears throat> and, and I could, uh, I'm sparing you, I could legit talk about this single word for five hours, so you're totally welcome. This word is only used five times in the entire New Testament, and John uses, it's John who uses this word all five times, and each usage is either about <clears throat> God the Holy Spirit or God the Son. Or, in the words of early church father Irenaeus, he says the Son and the Spirit are the two loving hands of the Father ready to embrace a broken world. Isn't that beautiful? Now, <clears throat> it gets a little bit more mind-bending in verse 18. Scroll down one more time. Verse 18. Jesus says, I, Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. So an orphan is about whether or not there's a father or a mother. So Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. <clears throat> First of all, this restates the trouble of verse one. Let not your hearts be troubled. Orphans are worried whether or not they're gonna belong to the family. But look at what Jesus is doing. Jesus is doing the Father's love and presence. He won't leave them as orphans. He will come to them. <clears throat> but, hey, 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 this is for fun and this is the migraine, woo-hoo. Does Jesus come to them? Well, he's not lying. So... No, it's the Spirit who comes to them. So, you gotta get it. I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. Is that about God the Father, God the Son, or God the Spirit? Yes, right? It's the best theological answer. 
And this Trinitarian reality ministers both God's paternal love and his eternal presence to his people. Now, that was just a quick survey, verse 6, verse 9, verse 10, verse 16, 18. That was just a quick, we're just touching the surface a little bit. We can't forget our question. How can we think about the Trinity in such a way that it leads to worship and life change? Now, to answer this, I want to take what we've said so far and use that as like a launching pad, and then I want to make Three observations that will answer our question and then offer three ways that we can respond to God as triune. So three observations to answer our question, three responses to live out our answer. Here we go. Observation number one. The only, excuse me, only the triune God of the Bible can be both the giver and the gift of salvation. Only the triune God of the Bible can be both the giver and the gift of salvation. Jim, why did you word it like that? Thanks so much for asking. It's worded like this because of all of the sending and giving language in John 14 and throughout John's gospel. We know the end zone verse. God gave his only son. That's elsewhere in John. Down in 14, 24, we didn't read this, but it says, Jesus says, the Father sent me. When the Son returns to the Father to go prepare a place, the Father and the Son both send and both give the Spirit. Verse 26 echoes these things. Jesus says, the Father will send the Holy Spirit in my name, the Helper. And the broad point of all this is only the triune God of the Bible can be both the giver and the gift of salvation. Now again, hey, hey, look, if you were one of the ones who was flipping the I don't care switch, again, I'm with you. I know this can feel abstract, but I assure you there is so much life in that statement, in that idea. No other world religion can come close to making this claim. Not Judaism, not Islam, not Hinduism. There is something so unique and powerful about this. Any gift from the divine can't itself be divine except within Orthodox Christianity. And think about the flip of it. If God is not both giver and gift, think about this, if he's not both giver and gift, then that means grace unravels and now it's up to us to earn and merit and work for salvation. If he is not both giver and gift, then it's up to you. And we, that doesn't work out so well when it's up to us. This truth should be a worship prod for us. He doesn't give us a gift and we unwrap it and then go, oh, now I have to do it all by myself. No, no, no. It's that he gives grace graciously in the same way that Paul says, I love this, in Romans 3, that God is the just and the justifier because of Jesus. God, in the gospel, is both giver and gift of salvation. Now clearly, the Bible paints for us a picture of pervasive human sinfulness. It's not just that verse one, yo, we're troubled, okay, that's it. It's not that. It's that we can't bridge the gap to God on our own. Sin and death have made it impossible to earn or merit salvation by our own efforts. But scripture also clearly paints a picture of God taking sole initiative to bridge that gap. He does not merely provide salvation. He is the provision and the salvation. He doesn't just make a way. He is the way and the truth and the life. And if you believe that, if you live like that is true, guess what? You get set free from having to do it all yourself. You get liberated from thinking it's all about you and all the weight is on your shoulders. So this little idea that God, the triune God, is both giver and gift of salvation That idea is crucial to our life of faith. That's observation number one. Next, and closely related, only the triune God of the Bible can rule over us as father, for us as son, and within us as spirit. Only the triune God of the Bible can rule over us as father, for us as son, and within us as Holy Spirit. So our first observation is about how father, son, and spirit are all self-giving in some way. But this thought is that each member of the Trinity carries out different roles in salvation, different roles in recreating the mess that we have made of God's good world. And to this point, John 14 is like a part of the Trinitarian iceberg that juts above the surface of the water. But the entire iceberg is how each person in the Godhead plays a certain part in the divine rescue plan. 
Some theologians say it like this. <clears throat> the Father is the author of salvation, sovereignly designing our deliverance. He's the one initiating all the sending and the giving to mend the brokenness of the world. The Father is the author of salvation. The Son is the actor of salvation. He has come to earth to live and die and rise for us. He has come to act out all the ways that Adam failed, that Israel failed, that we have failed as our representative. The Father is the author of salvation. The Son is the actor of salvation. And the Spirit is the applier of salvation. The Apostle Paul says he seals us. The Spirit seals us for the day of redemption in Ephesians chapter one. He causes us to be born again because of what the Son has done and what the Father has promised. All of this, that the Father is the author, the Son is the actor, the Spirit is the applier, all of this is the deep-seated theological reason behind why Jesus can say things like, hey, believe in God, believe also in me. He knows that what we need is for God to reign over us as Father, for us as Son, and within us as Spirit. <clears throat> look at the end of verse 17. Verse 17, look at the end there. You will know the Spirit, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The same God who is our Father who planned to save us, the same God who came in the person of Jesus to take our place on the cross, this same God in the person of the Spirit takes up residence in us to minister divine life and love in us and through us to the world around us. And I love how far this goes. <clears throat> Look at verse 12, he goes a step further. Jesus says, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Uh, Jesus? <laughs> Greater works than what you do, we're gonna do? Maybe the cross was throwing him the curveball, you know, like, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. They'll do greater works. Like, this just feels like, I, we're gonna do greater works than Jesus, right? <clears throat> what does he mean? Us doing greater works than him. You gotta be kidding. Look, hey, verse 12, look at the because. Because I go to the Father. Jesus is saying that we will do greater works than him because he goes to the Father. What does that mean? Well, that means that he has in view his accomplished work of cross and resurrection. He has in view him being with the Father and them giving us the Spirit. So the greater works, sure, might be greater in number, but they're also greater because they have the foundation of his finished work and the poured out Spirit. And this is all about God reigning in salvation and in and through us in different ways. Again, only the triune God of the Bible can rule over us as Father, for us as Son, and within us as Spirit. So, how do we think about the Trinity in a way that leads to worship and life change? First, only the triune God of the Bible can be the giver and the gift of salvation. <clears throat> Secondly, only the triune God of the Bible can rule over us as Father, for us as Son, and within us as spirit, and third observation here, <clears throat> only the triune God of the Bible can invite us into eternal communal love. Only the triune God of the Bible can invite us into eternal communal love. Now, <clears throat> if we are taking note of how Father, Son, and Spirit are all spoken of in this passage and elsewhere in John, we're gonna see the most bizarre thing. Now, I, I don't know if you guys are ready for this. It, this is really interesting. Father, Son, and Spirit have for all eternity, they have never not existed as Father, Son, and Spirit. Father, Son, and Spirit have forever, in eternity past, have forever shared perfect life and harmony and oneness and joy and shalom and delight and beauty and love together forever. God, in himself and by himself, has always been an eternal community of belonging and self-giving love. He has never not existed in that way, and guess what? He's always been happy about it. He's always really enjoyed it. Jesus says things like, probably 30 minutes from when this took place, when John 14 took place, <clears throat> he says things like, Father, glorify me with the same glory I had with you before time began. He talks about his and the Father's relationship with the Spirit outside our experience of them. And this is worth the theological migraine to consider. Because check this out. Now to me, look, to me, this is life-changing enough just to meditate on God like this. That's incredible enough. 
But the last verse that we read together, verse 20, goes one step further. Not only he exists as such, but he invites us to share in it. Look at verse 20. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and that you are in me, and that I am in you. Again, only the triune God of the Bible can invite us into eternal communal love. If he, look, if he were only unipersonal, he couldn't invite us into communal love. Also, th there's an implication of this. I, I don't know how you got your thoughts about God, maybe a Sunday school teacher a long time ago, maybe your parents, <clears throat> but this kind of thinking implies that God did not create you because he was lonely. He wasn't twiddling his huge, enormous, eternal thumbs one day and be like, I want somebody to come play with me. Like, that didn't happen. He's not bored, <clears throat> he's not lonely. He d Look, if that's the case, that means he's deficient and lacking and he should not be worshiped. Rather, he created us as an overflow of his own divine delight. And in creation and in redemption, he bids us to come and partake in his mutual delight and in his reciprocated affection. Father, Son, and Spirit have enjoyed hanging out with each other forever, before it all began. It was a constant communication and flow of love. For all time, God has been singing an everlasting solo that is somehow also three-part harmony, and he invites us to sing along. And this should indefinitely inoculate us with humility and gratitude that he welcomes us into his very eternal communal love. And if that does not tie weights around your ankles and throw you in the deep end of the worship pool, I can't help you, okay? <clears throat> That's incredible, that's so beautiful. So to me, <clears throat> these three ideas are helpful as we think about the Trinity. <clears throat> but I'm still confounded that Jesus insinuates these things in the face of his friends being troubled, remember? Like what I'm talking about, you're like, that's the content of a theology class that I don't really wanna to go to. That's what you're thinking. <clears throat> and Jesus' friends go, hey man, I got questions. I'm confused, I'm troubled, I'm scared right now. And Jesus goes, aha, Trinitarianism, all right? So how in the world <clears throat> do, do these things relate? How in the world do these things change us? Because we wanted to lead to worship and life change, right? Well, just to prove to you that the troubled hearts of the disciples are still on the mind of Jesus, look down in verse 27, we didn't read this verse, but look, he ends the same way he started. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. That's verse one and verse 27. Meaning, he's saying all this stuff to people who are sweating and fretting. This picture of God that he's painting is against the backdrop of people who have frenetic and fragile lives just like us. So, <clears throat> we need practical steps for responding to this portrait of God in John 14. Here we go, three responses to mirror our three observations. Here we go, response one, bow before the mystery, bow before the mystery. <clears throat> this parallels the perplexing reality that God is three and one, that he is giver and gift, that he is provider and provision. <clears throat> so how does it all work? Well, we've explored a little bit of it, but so much of it we just don't know, so we need to learn to bow before the mystery, bow before God as mysterious. Uh, author Joe Rigney has written a book called The Things of Earth. I highly suggest it. I see I can't not do a book commercial. But in his book, The Things of Earth, he has a singular page that encapsulates all these things nicely. <clears throat> it's a longer section, but this is really, really powerful. Joe Rigney writes, the triune God of scripture lives. He is not static. He is not lifeless, he is not bored, he is not boring. He is the living God. He is the father of lights, the fount of divinity, the origin of origins, begetting yet unbegotten, deity in the prime, the almighty maker of heaven and earth. He is the beloved son, word of the father, God's sermon and song, God's image and wisdom, very God of very God, begotten before all worlds. He is the Holy Spirit, breath of the living God, the wind in his sails, the river of his delights, the glad bond of loving union proceeding forth from both father and son. <clears throat> this God, father, son, and spirit, knowing each other, loving each other, 
delighting in each other from all eternity with no needs, no wants, no lack. This God is the true God, complete and total and infinite in happiness. This is what God is really like. This is no abstract deity, no impersonal divinity. God is love, dynamic, alive, abundant, overflowing. Relationship is at the very heart of reality. The original word of God is God over again. And his love for himself is so potent that it is a person. Absentee landlord, hardly. Generic watchmaker, not a chance. He is a jealous husband, a consuming fire, a cloud of glory that outshines the sun. He is a thundering tornado of knowledge and love and joy and life. And Father, Son, and Spirit so love the fullness of their shared life that they think it fitting and right that such glorious knowledge and love and joy overflow. So they create a world and they create vessels to hold the fullness of their divine joy. You cannot pencil that God in when you've got time. You cannot slip in, into your schedule when you're flexible. You are not allowed <clears throat> to behold a God like that and shrug. You must, we must bow before a God like this with our hand on our mouths. In reverence, in awe, in wonder, we should bow before the mystery of a God who is worthy and good somehow as Father, Son, and Spirit. Bow before the mystery. Next, we should believe his sovereignty. Believe his sovereignty. What I mean is that if God is like we've been talking about, if, if he really is how Rigney describes him, if he really is behind the scenes in ways that we can't fathom, like Jesus is saying in John 14, then we need to take a deep breath and we need to trust his nature as Trinity and we need to take the next step and trust his faithfulness as sovereignty. Hey, isn't this, look, isn't this why Thomas and Philip have questions in verses five and eight? They don't understand how it all works. They don't understand why the stuff is happening. They, don't, they can't explain it all. That's why they're troubled in verse one and verse 27. But guess who's not worried? Guess who's not scared? Jesus ain't sweating. He's not worried. He knows that only the triune God of the Bible is sovereign in such a way so as to rule over us as Father, for us as Son, and within us as Spirit. And guess what this means? That means more is going on in your life than you think when you're worried about the bills that you gotta pay or your kids making terrible decisions or your romantic life. More is going on than you think. If there is a sovereign three-person God behind everything we face, we can actually believe his promises and trust his grace when we're wrestling with, with a sin or an idol or an addiction. Like, what other options do we have? Where else are we gonna go? Peter said it in John 6, Lord, where else are we gonna go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else are we gonna look when we're depressed or, or angry or anxious or weighed down by fear? Bowing before the mystery and believing the sovereignty of our triune God is the only thing that's going to sustain us. We can't fix that stuff on our own. We have to believe that he's at work in it. And please get this, in everything God is doing, he is doing hundreds of things that you might not see or recognize. In everything he's doing. So whatever our burdens might be, they can be entrusted to a triune, sovereign God. And Jesus is extending the same invitation to Thomas and Philip that night before the cross, and he extends the same to us today. So, bow before the mystery. Believe his sovereignty. And our last response to God as triune is, belong to his family. <clears throat> belong to his family. Remember, this portrait of God in John 14 is an invitation to join in the divine life, to share in his communal love, and this invitation is extended to all to be a part of God's family. And again, I know that I've talked to some of you and you go, I know I'm supposed to do the church thing, I know I'm supposed to do the community group thing or whatever, but Jim, I've done it and I still, there's a distance. It's a soul thing. It's not a, like my body in the same space as other people thing. And you feel disconnected. <clears throat> you don't have a sense of community or belonging. And that ache is very present in your life. 
And the good news for you today, brother or sister, is that God has designed you to belong to him and his family, and not just to know it categorically, but to feel it and sense it. C.S. Lewis writes, the whole dance, the whole drama and pattern of the tri-personal life of God, each of us is called to take our place in that dance. That's what we're talking about. God, as triune, is invitation. That is exactly why Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, and I'm gonna come and I'm gonna take you to myself. We are hardwired for belonging to God and to his family. And if you are a part of the life of God and the life of his people, then this is just a reminder, an exhortation, an encouragement to live like that's true. Live like you belong to the family. Live like you are his daughter or his son. There's great beauty there. Trust like you are his daughter or his son. We belong to him. Live as though you are a part of the eternal triune life of God. Now maybe you're here today and you know that you're not trusting God for real life, you know that you're not a part of God's family. Like you have legitimate questions, but you're not willing to make that step and to trust Jesus. If that's you, just think with me for just a second. Don't you need a God bigger than your categories? Don't, Don't you need a God bigger than the boxes that we often put him in? Don't you need a God who isn't scared of the temporal struggle you're facing because he himself is eternal triune life and peace? Don't you need a God who is both knowable and mysterious? Because if we could completely figure him out, then we'd be smarter than him. Don't you need a God who knows and is true community? He is belonging unto and with himself. And he calls all of us to share in that life. We need a triune God who stands as sovereign over, present in, and understanding of every single part of our lives. And if we don't have that, then we don't have any hope. And then we should flip verse one on its head. We should let our hearts be troubled and we shouldn't believe in Jesus. And this is why the message of Jesus is so incredible because Jesus is the triune God who has come near to us to save us. And when we believe in him, we partake in the life that he wants for us. At the cross, he has taken all of our brokenness into himself, all of our sin into himself, all of our confusion into himself. And now he offers us healing and forgiveness and life to anybody who would trust him. And for all of us, following the way of Jesus, please get this, following the way of Jesus is the supreme way that we bow before the mystery and believe the sovereignty and belong to, the, to his family. That's the way that it happens. When we look away from ourselves in repentance, when we loosen our grip on our way of doing things, and when we cling tightly to Jesus as way and truth and life, that is precisely how Trinitarian thinking can enter our souls and our brains and slowly become worshipful and meaningful and practical. This is how it will change how we experience all the pain and the curveballs that life throws at us. When we see everything in light of what God is doing in Jesus. And this is exactly, exactly why Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Fellowship Greenville, I've got really good news today. Here is your God, the triune creator and redeemer of Israel who invites us into his own eternal life and love. And it does not get any better than that. Let's pray together. Father, creator, redeemer of Israel, savior, king, wise judge, healer. We love you and we trust you. Jesus, our brother, our friend, our Lord, our hero, our substitute, our representative, we love you and we trust you. Holy Spirit, the seal of our redemption, the wind in our sails, the very breath of God, the fullness of his presence within us. Comforter, counselor, keeper, advocate. Spirit, we love you and we trust you. Father, Son, and Spirit, we thank you that you are way bigger than all the categories that we have for you. And we pray that that glorious mystery is joyful invitation and not confounding confusion. 
we thank you that you are sovereign and glorious and loving and that you continually woo us and invite us into your own life. We thank you for all these things coming clear to us in the gospel of Jesus. Jesus, we love you. You're the best. Amen.